my passion for writing those books is to bring people to faith in Christ. Every book I write with the intent that people be able to use it to give it to people who are not yet believers to bring them to faith in Christ. And I think the book I just finished is now an editorial. Uh, it's got a tentative title, Dual Revelation, Biblical Inerrancy and Concordism. I likewise am praying that that book will be effective in bringing people to faith in Christ. Uh, and you know, this first slide just simply lets you know that if you don't get to ask your questions today or this weekend, all of the scholars here at Reasons to Believe do take questions on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, take advantage of that. We have a 24 seven YouTube channel and every day new video clips go up there. And right now I'm realizing more people are discovering us through YouTube than they are through our books or our podcasts. Well, what I'd like to do is, you know, most of the book I've written is on the theological issues, but for this talk, I'm kind of selecting out the science because I think that's something that uh, the theologians really haven't appreciated to the degree they do. And it kind of put an irony into this talk. It's reflections on the non-concordist concordism. You know, in doing the research and all the theologians writing about concordism, what I realize, even when they identify themselves as non-concordist, they really are concordist. Everybody is in concordist. We just concord in different ways. Although you do have this one called uh, separate magisteria, the Stephen J. Gould model, which says that you've got the record of nature, the record of scripture, they're completely separate. These are the only people I would recognize as being true non-concordists. There's no overlap between the two. They're completely different uh, revelations. And contrasted uh, with hard concordism, last night I said I would try to define some terms of uh, different concordist models. Hard concordism, I think, is best illustrated by all the letters and manuscripts that we receive here at Reasons to Believe uh, from our constituents to say, you know what, I think I've found particle physics in the book of Job or the book of Genesis, or here's where I think the biblical text is talking about Neanderthals. And I always respond to these people by saying, we at Reasons to Believe believe that the Bible is inspired for all generations. And if it's inspired for all generations, uh, it's not going to bring in vocabulary or evidence and stuff that only one generation or a few generations are aware of. So our position is the Bible is silent on dinosaurs because only the last 150 years of people even know what dinosaurs uh, are. The position we take at Reasons to Believe, I think is best described by Bernard Ram's term. Bernard Ram coined this term moderate concordism back in the 1950s. And back in the 1950s, he held a view on the book of scripture and the book of nature that's quite close to the position we take at Reasons to Believe, that there's enough overlap between the two books that we can use one book to corroborate and verify the revelation in the other book. And I'm personally comfortable with that perspective because I see that as a redemptive hermeneutic on both the book of nature and the book of scripture. That what I see in the book of scripture is a repeated declaration, God begins his works of redemption before he creates anything at all, which would imply that everything that God creates is for the purpose of bringing billions of humans into a redemptive relationship with himself. And so we see that clearly in the uh, book of scripture. I think we also see a clarity in the book of nature. And there's enough material in the book of nature uh, to corroborate and affirm what's in the book of scripture. And likewise, it works the other way around. Uh, the two affirm uh, one another. A term that's popular these days is what's referred to as soft concordism, popular with a lot of uh, conservative evangelical theologians who are trying to be especially conservative in saying, let's not read too much overlap between the two books, because you might be wrong in saying that uh, this book is saying this about the other book. Let's play it very safe. Uh, but frequently they play it so safe that they're not able to use one book to corroborate the other. And this winds up having a crippling effect on trying to bring people to faith in Christ. Uh, so we can be too conservative. And uh, you say, well, you could also be too aggressive. 
And I like that tension. I think it's important that, uh, you know, we explore what's going on in the two books. And hey, if we're being too aggressive, we back up. If we're not being aggressive enough, we move forward. And so exactly where the boundaries go and the overlap, I see as something that's dynamic. We're learning more about each book as uh, each generation of Christianity goes by. And so I think we've got a better handle on where the boundaries exist today than we did say in the time of the early church fathers. And I think a generation from now will have a better idea of the boundary, but we're never gonna be able to perfectly define the boundaries, which is why we need to continue to fund research theologians and research scientists so that in their ongoing work, they can help us better define uh, where those boundaries are. You heard the comment uh, last night, uh, complimentary. And uh, this is a view that's uh, quite popular amongst uh, Christians who take a theistic evolutionary perspective or an evolutionary creationist perspective. You heard last night that the scholars here had reasons to believe, worked with the scholars of Biologos and we produced a two views book. And in that book, you see that they take this complementary view where they say, yes, there's overlap, but it's minor. In fact, it's so minor that all we could really discern from our perspective is that they would agree that the Bible actually does say that there's a beginning to the universe, uh, but apparently they're not prepared to go any further than that and saying there's overlap between the two books. The book of nature says there's a beginning, the book of scripture says that there's a beginning, but they're reluctant to see any more in that. I mean, a great example for would be Tremper Longman's commentary on the book of Job. Both of us have written books on Job. In my book, I'm quite forward in talking about all the sciences in the book of Job and how that affirms what's in the book of nature. And the book of nature affirms that the Bible actually got the science right. His commentary, there's no science whatsoever uh, in the uh, book of uh, Job. So that's the complementary view. And in doing the research for this book, I was asking myself the question, where did all this get started? I mean, it's been around in the liberal Christian community for a couple of centuries, but how did this get a foothold in the conservative uh, Christian evangelical theological camp? And in going through it all is my wife that reminded me, well, you should be aware of this. You were there at the very beginning. And the very beginning uh, was back in 1991 where I was invited to speak at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And every year, every two years, they sponsor what are called the Cancer Lectures in Systematic Theology. And back in 1991, the theme was the exegesis and science of Genesis 1. And they said, we've invited Bruce Walke to deal with the exegesis of Genesis 1. We want you to deal uh, with the science. And uh, yeah, this is actually what we looked like back in 1991. So uh, you can see the thermodynamics has taken its toll on me uh, since 1991. For Bruce, it hasn't taken much of a toll at all. So I'm, I'm a little bit envious in that uh, respect. Uh, but the irony of that event, uh, it went on for a week and, uh, you know, he was dealing with the exegesis. I was dealing with the science. But what kind of got the audience, Bruce seemed to speak more about science than he did about exegesis. And therefore I kind of wound up speaking more about exegesis than I did about uh, science. And uh, this is a direct quote from Bruce uh, in that uh, 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 week long dialogue. Quote, the genre of Genesis one cannot possibly be fully literal historical or chronological, for to interpret it that way runs into contradictions with science that are impossible to reconcile. And he repeated that. And then there was this uh, uh, senior uh, graduate student getting his doctoral degree in theology who came to the Q&A microphone. And this is a direct quote from him. He says, I've been here for a couple of days, quote, I find it ironic that the scientist has no problem with a literal historical interpretation of Genesis, while the theologian is convinced that science makes such an interpretation impossible. And I think what was most enjoyable for me 
was having lunch with Bruce and uh, Leeson Archer, uh, Cancer himself, and uh, also uh, uh, Walt Kaiser. Every day we'd have lunch together and we would continue to debate the issues uh, that were uh, brought up. <laughs> Three years later, I spoke at Regent College and Bruce at that time uh, was a professor uh, at uh, Regent, uh, had the predominant influence there at the Regent. And that's when I discovered that at that point, 1994, he had fully embraced uh, theistic evolution and basically had tremendous influence in that college. And a few years later, they told me, uh, well, we really don't want you speaking at Regent anymore. Uh, all of us are now uh, taking a theistic evolutionary perspective. And then later, uh, Bruce wound up endorsing uh, this book, Inspiration and Incarnation by Peter Enns. Ken and I, uh, and I think Fuzz Rana, yeah, we all met Peter Enns in Francis Collins' home about 15 years ago. Each of us shared our testimony. I shared my testimony of how science persuaded me the Bible was the word of God. And I remember uh, Peter coming up to me and saying, I'm so glad you came to faith in Christ, even though we know that science uh, is not a vehicle for bringing people to faith in Christ. I think you heard them say that uh, as well. So I said, well, again, it reminded me of Bruce Walke. Uh, you know, I'm the scientist, he's not, and yet uh, we take these different perspectives. And here's a quote from uh, Tremper Longman. Uh, the persuasiveness, and this, he, he wrote this in a foreword to Adam in the Genome, uh, by Venema and Scott McKnight. But what he wrote in the preface with a foreword was, the pervasiveness of the theory presented by Darwin and genetic evidence that humanity begins not with a single couple, but rather an original population of some thousands requires such an interpretation. And the interpretation is referring to, we need to strip the Bible of all these claims that it's addressing scientific issues, except for the origin of the, the universe. So that explains the title I gave for this talk, uh, the concordism of the non-concordists, where they say we have to take all this overlap uh, out of the two books. But what's driving that is their belief that uh, naturalism explains the origin of life and the entire history of life right up to human beings. And since they're convinced that that scientific model is correct, they're saying we have to reinterpret the Bible accordingly. And therefore, the creation text in the Bible should not be interpreted as literal or historical, because after all, we have to fit this uh, with what we see coming out of naturalistic evolutionary uh, biology. And you see this in the book by Dennis Veneman and Scott McKnight, the Adam and Eve of the Bible are a literary Adam and Eve. They're not an historical Adam and Eve. And this is all based on their belief that genetics now uh, proves that humans came from a population of at least hundreds, if not thousands, uh, 10,000. If you read uh, Francis Collins' book, it can't be the biblical two. And uh, we also see them uh, going beyond that and saying neither the Old Testament nor Romans 5 blames Adam for the sin of others, or blames Adam for her own death. And again, we can go back to those dialogues we had with the biologo scientists and theologians. And I think what was very forthcoming is when one of them said, the biggest problem we face is what do we do with Paul and Romans 5? And so at least they're acknowledging that, uh, you know, this issue has significant theological implications beyond just the doctrine of creation. And in several of the books I've been reading by theologians are saying this archaic idea of original sin has got to go. As you heard me mention last night, they're even claiming that Paul is not the scholar that we thought he was, uh, that he wasn't all that uh, careful in uh, what uh, he wrote. And I don't know about you, but when I first read the New Testament epistles, I was incredibly impressed with the scholarship of the Apostle Paul. But for the first time, again, as I read the theological literature of the past 2000 years, it's really only in the past 20 years that I've seen conservative scholars, theologians, disparaging the character 
and the scholarship of the Apostle Paul. Then we have Dennis Lamoureux, uh, false assumption of scientific concordance. It says the false assumption is the belief that there is an alignment between the Bible and the facts of modern science. And he's referring to is not astrophysics. He's referring to evolutionary biology. So let me say a little bit about naturalistic and theistic evolution and evolutionary biology, because to me, this is the great irony. What I'm seeing in the scientific literature are people who are not theists, but experts in the field of paleontology and genetics and evolutionary biology saying, we seem to be in trouble in trying to defend our naturalistic model. It's conservative theologians who are convinced this is right. I don't see this amongst the biologists who are experts in the discipline. And the model is that all Earth's life is descended from natural means from the last universal common ancestor, which you see in the scientific literature, LUCA, last universal common ancestor, which is basically the first microbe that ever appeared on planet Earth. We all came from a bacterium. And how did that happen? Well, life becomes gradually and progressively more complex through common descent with changes brought about by natural selection, mutations, gene exchange, and epigenetics. Now, I hear the term Darwinism being thrown around here. In reading the scientific literature, these naturalistic evolution of biologists do not like to be called Darwinists because Darwin was really only dealing with natural selection. They don't even like being referred to as neo-Darwinists. The neo-Darwinists would say, hey, the changes take place through natural selection and mutations. Rather, what you're seeing is don't put us in those narrow boxes. We believe the changes take place not just through natural selection and mutations, but through horizontal gene exchange and through epigenetics. So this is the more sophisticated model, but notice that all four of these uh, mechanisms bring about relatively small morphological changes, and more significantly, the changes are typically highly temporal. They don't last with rare exceptions. And therefore the prediction from a naturalistic perspective, the evolutionary mechanisms, these four mechanisms, will yield a proliferation of additional species. So new species will arise over time. And if you wait long enough, the proliferation of species will eventually produce new genera. And if you wait even longer, the proliferation of new genera uh, will eventually produce new families. And the proliferation of new families over much, much more time will produce new orders. And the proliferation of new orders over an enormous period of time eventually produce new classes and the proliferation of new classes over a yet much longer period of time eventually will produce new phyla. But here's the problem. In several places within the fossil record, we see the opposite of what the naturalistic, theistic evolutionary models would predict. So for example, when you look at the Avalon and Cambrian explosions of life, what do we see? The new phyla appear first, they don't appear last. They appear first. They appear simultaneously and suddenly, and they appear as soon as physical and chemical conditions first permit their existence. So to give a specific example, the Avalon explosion 575 million years ago took place right after the gas gears uh, you know, uh, glaciation event and was that glaciation event that suddenly jumped the oxygen content in the atmosphere <coughs> from less than 1%, there's a sudden jump up to 8%. 8% is the minimum you need for animals to exist. If you go 1%, that's great if you're a microbe, but if you're a, an animal with a significant body size, you need a minimum of 8%. But the moment it hits 8%, we see this sudden, immediate, simultaneous proliferation of Avalon uh, phyla. The Cameron explosion 538 million years ago, it's a new date that's been established with some precision. That's when the oxygen content suddenly jumps from 8% to 
At 8%, you can't have animals with digestive tracts, circulation systems. Uh, you can't have them with a nervous system, a brain, or a heart. 10% permits that to happen. But the moment it hits 10%, you get this sudden appearance, not just a few phyla, but dozens of phyla, all appearing suddenly and simultaneously the moment it hits 10%. And here's a couple of quotes uh, from non-theistic uh, paleontologists and evolutionary biologists. And so uh, we have this statement from Erwin, Ballantine, and Sapowski in the journal Evolution. Quote, there are no indications that the evolutionary activity at the family level was driving the origination of higher level taxa. And this is a reference to the Cambrian explosion. And again, they write, the diversification of phyla occurs before that of classes, classes before that of orders, and orders before that of families. And the emphasis you see there is in the original. They were the ones that made this emphasis and made the point this is the opposite of what our naturalistic models uh, would indeed uh, predict. <coughs> and then there's this uh, debate within the scientific literature. What does the fossil record reveal about the history of life? And what does the genetics reveal about the history of life? And typically the genetics is referred to as molecular clocks. And from a naturalistic perspective, we would expect, in fact, we would require that the genetic changes should always match the fossil record changes. From a creation perspective, they could match, but they don't have to match. If God is supernaturally involved, he could make it match or a dismatch is okay as well. But from a naturalistic perspective, they always must match. But what do we see? The phylogenetic evolutionary trees should always match the paleontological evolutionary trees, the fossil record in the latter case, the genetics in the former. But what we notice is that the fossil record dates for morphological changes often contradict the molecular clock dates. Not always, but they do contradict uh, frequently and sometimes by as much as one quarter of a billion years. So we're not talking a small departure, it's a major departure. If you wanna read about the details, I wrote an article, I put out a blog every week called Today's New Reason to Believe, and the August 19, 2019 issue deals with the scientific literature where this problem is brought out and brought out for the first time in an explicit way. And then we've got this uh, statement that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, where they say the greatest examples of gene tree conflict correspond with the highest rates of morphological innovation. They occur episodically throughout Earth's life's history. Again, this is what you'd anticipate from a creation perspective, but not at all what you'd anticipate from a naturalistic perspective. And these observations, perfectly match the actions of a supernatural agent that's intent on compensating for the sun's increasing brightness while ensuring life is as abundant, diverse, and enduring as the laws of physics would permit. Something we heard last night is that the scientific community tends to hyper-specialize. In fact, if you're doing research at a high academic level, you really have to hyper-specialize. That was my experience when I was at Caltech. I had to focus all of my scientific reading on the narrow subdiscipline of radio astronomy uh, that I was involved in. I didn't have time to really look at the rest of the astronomical literature, let alone literature outside of the discipline of astronomy. This also is a problem pervading evolutionary biology. They're not really paying attention to the astrophysical literature. And as I engage these evolutionary biologists personally, I notice they all presume that the physics of the sun is static. The physics of the sun is not static. The sun gets brighter and brighter as it continues to fuse hydrogen into helium in its nuclear core. And so, for example, today, the luminosity of the sun is about 23% brighter than it was when the first bacterium appeared on the surface of the Earth. And life can only tolerate about a 1% change in the luminosity unless something is done to compensate for the increased luminosity of the sun. 
namely to bring down the greenhouse gases. And so at the origin of life on planet Earth, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, was about 50,000 parts uh, per million. Today it's 400 parts per million. The methane content was a lot greater. So as the sun got brighter and brighter, the greenhouse gases in Earth's atmosphere became progressively less and less. So that even though the sun was getting brighter, the temperature in the surface of the Earth was kept optimal for life by pulling down the greenhouse gases to perfectly compensate for the ongoing brightness of the sun. And how was this done? Well, it's life that controls the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So by ensuring it had just the right life, of just the right diversity and abundance at just the right times, then we can keep the temperature on the surface of the earth uh, optimal for life. But here's the bottom line. It takes someone who knows the future physics of the sun, earth, and moon to remove no longer compensating life from planet earth and replace it with exactly the right life forms at just the right times in just the right amounts in just the right locations. And when you look at the fossil record, that's exactly what you see. You see these mass extinction events where 50 to 90% of the species of life on planet Earth is driven suddenly to extinction. But in a very short time afterwards, there's a mass speciation event where you get millions of new species suddenly appearing on the face of the Earth. But the mass extinction events and the mass speciation events are exactly what's needed to perfectly compensate for the brightening of the sun. Now, this is what we see in the fossil record, but the Bible said it first, 3,000 years ago, what we see in Psalm 104. Uh, you know, they die, referring to life on planet Earth, and return to the dust. And when you send your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the Earth. The Bible said it first. Science has now discovered it. Well, I've only got a few minutes left, and much of what is in my book is dealing with what theologians think the ancients believe. And so what I'm discovering is there's this 21st century hubris that the ancients were really incredibly ignorant about science. And not only ignorant about science, they didn't care two cents about science. They were not at all concerned about astronomy uh, or physics or biology. And they had this belief that there was a solid dome above the earth with the stars attached to the inside of the solid dome and that there was this water over the solid dome and there's holes in the solid dome, that's where the rain comes from, that the earth was flat. Then there's this belief that all the ancient civilizations have believed this. Well, what you actually discover, uh, and then, you know, these are comments from several theologians. I'm just going to quickly go through this since I'm out of time, uh, where they claim that all the ancients believed this. Uh, but what we notice is they're claiming that the Assyrians and the Egyptians believed this, but it was the Assyrians and the Egyptians that were irrigating the agricultural lands. And they were well aware uh, of the Archimedes principle, uh, even before Archimedes. They recognized there was a limit to how far you can pump up water. And therefore they all realized it was impossible to have water uh, thousands of miles above the earth, above this uh, dome. And in fact, uh, the Assyrian specialist, Wilford Lambert wrote that he could find no evidence that the Mesopotamians believed in a hard dome heaven. We need to distinguish between the fantasy literature, the religious literature, the political literature, and their scientific literature, just like we need to do uh, today. And we have people claiming that uh, the ancients really didn't care two bits uh, about the universe. And again, I'm gonna go through all this, but what do we really discover? There's literally thousands all over Europe and Asia of these stone hinges. This is Avery, it covered nine square miles. So this is not uh, at all a trivial thing. This is the best known one, Stonehenge. And this book, Stonehenge Decoded, makes the point that this is constructed to observe not just the sun and the moon, uh, but the planets and the stars as well. In fact, if you look at the Astrophysical Journal, you will see they frequently cite 
uh, the astronomical records of the ancient Egyptians 3,000, 4,000 years ago, particularly on variable stars. And because this data dates back thousands of years ago, we're able to compare the astronomy of the ancient Egyptians with the measurements we're making today and actually come up with much superior models of the interior physics of these stars. And this idea that they all thought that the world was flat, well, they were very intent on observing the eclipses of the sun and the moon and notice that you always get a, a circular shape of the shadow during a lunar eclipse. You see the same thing with solar eclipses. And uh, even though this didn't get into the written ancient literature until the fourth century uh, BC, uh, because this is being observed all over the world thousands of years ago, I think it's fair to conclude uh, that it's a simple myth that the ancients believed that the world was flat. There was plenty of evidence showing them as otherwise. And this is actually a set of measurements they made of the sun's distance, diameter, the moon's distance, the star's distances, the length of the year. Now, these are not accurate measurements, except for the last one. They got the last one right to five places of the decimal. Uh, the first one uh, was right to within a couple of percent. The others are off by 30, 40%. But it does make the point, they had a fairly decent picture of what the solar system uh, looked like long before uh, the invention of the telescope. And you see this in the scriptures, uh, 49 places the moon is mentioned. And also it tells us uh, that Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And my final comment is people presume, what I'm seeing in this literature is this idea, we in the 21st century have evolved where we now have a much average higher IQ than people who lived thousands of years before. What I believe they're not taking into account is climate stability. The climate stability of people living before the Neolithic revolution uh, was about plus or minus eight degrees centigrade. And then from 9,000 years ago uh, until 1,000 years ago, it was varying by plus or minus 0.65 degrees. But in the last 1,000 years, plus or minus only 0 0.06 degrees. And so it's not that our IQ has become superior, it's that we've had the benefit of increasing climate stability. This is what enabled us to catapult science in a degree that was not possible for our forefathers. Thank you. Mm -hmm.